morning everyone how are you it is saturday march 27th this is episode 192 i can't believe we're almost at 200 this is just crazy uh welcome i hope you guys are well um the chat is going crazy and i'm catching up i was standing here reading through it and then i realized it was after 8 30. <laughs> We had a little bit of a crazy start because everybody um, slept in this morning, which is really unusual for us. And uh, Mike and I didn't have very good sleep last night. He was up until 2 a.m. working and um, James slept in until 20 after 7. And then there was kind of like this mad rush of, oh my goodness, it's podcast morning, we gotta go. So, and then the kids would not stop fighting. So I always find whenever we're kind of in a bit of a rush and we're sort of feeling it a little bit in terms of like the pressure to go um they really kind of start ranging at each other so that's super frustrating um because it was a little bit crazy you you might notice that i'm standing uh the our desk that we built back during um the fall is a sit to stand desk so it's actually a countertop so that we could get it the length that we wanted it and um, the the legs are have a sit to stand mechanism which is great except that I came in here and I was like oh no <laughs> Mike put it to stand last night because it was so late and he was up so late so I am standing so I I'm actually kind of curious to see how that goes because um, I've thought about doing a standing podcast before and I've thought about transitioning to doing the podcast standing and uh, I just was worried that I would start doing this and start like swaying. So um, I'm just going to kind of see how it goes and let me know if you guys notice any differences because sometimes I find um, I end up sitting a lot and I'm sure you guys understand that too. I don't want to stand all the time either. I think there's a happy medium. Um, but you know, we were certainly built for gentle movement and uh, you know, as human beings, I mean, and I do spend a lot of time sitting. So I thought, well, maybe I could podcast standing. So let me know. So how is everybody? I know Alicia, you've had a bit of a health situation. So thoughts going out to you. Mm. Um, we had the second week of spring break this week. So the kids were home again all week. So we actually, Mike took the day off yesterday because we just haven't had any time together as a family during spring break. Cause normally we would take a few days and we would go camping or we would try to get away, but we've had a really, really cold summer here. Um, I'm coming to you from the Southwestern um, side of British Columbia in Canada, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, it's been really cold and rainy and wet. And we've had a couple of lovely days of sun, but again, very, very cold jackets, sweaters, and um, Mike took yesterday off so that we could have a day together. So we actually took the kids to the zoo, which is lovely because everything's super spread out. People are super like spread out. Lots of people, pretty much everyone was wearing masks. Um, towards the back of the zoo where it gets really spread out, people had them off, but it was really quite lovely. We went with the whole cul-de-sac. BC has this thing in place right now that's um, 10, space, 10 faces open spaces. And so our cul-de-sac is actually perfect because there's seven adults and then um, there's the kids. So, no, that's not right. Two, four, six, there's eight adults. So, and then the kids are all able to play because there's only like five kids. So it works out really well. So we all went and uh, we had a really good time and a couple of the, the dads came. So Mike was able to come and uh, the kids petered out in the afternoon. They were pretty tired, but it was a lovely way to kind of finish spring break. So, and then Nora's birthday's on Monday. So it's sort of a, you know, one last thing. And then we're sort of at the end of March and we're into April, which is just crazy. So do you guys have any plans for the weekend? Are you guys doing anything or working on anything in particular? I know I did see, um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody was working on their Zero to Hero sweater. Um, and there was a couple of people that mentioned about being in their gardens quite a bit. Um, I think my friend Diana said that she's carding cause, um, and doing fiber prep. Um, what else is everybody doing? I have to admit last night we, uh, the cold, so we, we went to the zoo with the, um, all of our cul-de-sac and then yesterday evening us moms got together because we tried the four of us try to get together um, in on Friday evenings even if it's just for like an hour just to kind of check in about the week and see how everybody's doing and we were sitting um, um, in one of the um, driveways just outside and it was interesting because for the first time in a long time I didn't actually get really 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 cold we were all wearing our jackets and stuff but it wasn't um, 
it wasn't as cold as it's been. So small wins. In today's show, I've got a finished spin, which is long overdue. It was Eve actually gave me my homework and, um, which was really, really cool because it actually lit a bit of a fire under my butt and got me to get it finished. And then uh, I have a new cast on that I thought that I would share with you that is actually for our April content for the Kiviet. And I was going to talk a little bit about my um, Romney, which is why it's sitting here, but I actually didn't get anything done on it. I was really hoping to have some more bobbins spun, but spring break, right? So that's exciting, Diana. Working on samples for a top secret School of Sweet Georgia workshop. That's awesome. There is some very, very cool stuff coming up um, in the School of Sweet Georgia over the next year. Um, the, the content planning and everything is really, really exciting. Um, there's some really awesome stuff going on, so that's wonderful. Um, what else is going on with you guys? Washing Rambo fleece and sorting a Shetland fleece. That's what Kaylee's doing. That's wonderful. Judy is knitting and spinning today. Uh, Diane finished her Zero to Hero uh, John Arbin sweater. That's amazing. Jenny is washing a Finn Romney fleece. Um, it was a, it's a Finn, a Finn Romney cross. Um, Kelly is drinking coffee. I'm with you, Kelly. <laughs> it's too early to be up and working on projects. <laughs> um, oh, Wendy is combing her cashmere goats. D Dana is uh, has finally started her gentle morning. Uh, Cheryl has finished knitting her Malbin. Oh, we're going to talk about that today, Cheryl. That's awesome. Um, you'll have to post uh, finished photos. Um, Diana, um, who else is doing? What's? Oh, hi, Becca. Good to see you. Um, what else? Chris, you're going to have to turn up your speakers maybe. Um, I'm sorry that you're having sound issues. Actually, the crackling on the speakers yesterday, we went through everything with all the sound and everything. And we, like Mike and I, you know, went through it all. Um, and we adjusted some of the sound stuff so that it would actually be louder at your end. And um, we were, we fixed one of the filters that was causing all of the crackling. Because as soon as we, I can record, I don't have to stream to be able to record. Um, in OBS and um, so we recorded some some audio and sure enough the crackling was actually quite a bit louder on the recording than it was even on YouTube so um, we fixed it all uh, what else are people doing sample for hand spun cabin sweater um, no Noemi's using some um, suffix some naturally dyed suffix Leanne's learning how to twist fringe you'll have to let us know how that goes um, what else Figure out my next spin while the last one soaks. That's awesome, Laura. Uh, drum carding, hand flicked Shetland. Cleaning the kitchen. Oh, Becca. <laughs> Getting ingredients prepped for dinner. So we're having Nora's birthday dinner tonight. Just in case the kids are up a bit late tonight. And we're going to do her gifts and everything tonight, which is two, uh, two days early. But my parents used to do this for us as well. So that if it was on a Saturday night rather than on like a Monday night or a Sunday night or a Tuesday night, we didn't have to get through the whole rest of the week being tired. So we're doing it tonight with her. And um, she's requested Mexican food for dinner. So I've got a little bit of cooking ahead of me uh, this afternoon. But I really love cooking, so it's fine. But... Mm. I'm going to do Mexican rice and um, mango pepper onion saute and yeah, some really fun stuff. I'm going to make you guys all hungry. Um, anyhow, let's get into the show. So, um, Karma, you may just need to turn it up a little bit maybe. I, I don't think anybody else is having issues with sound this morning. I think it's just a couple of you. So maybe uh, just, yeah, turn it, turn it up. Um, okay, let's get into the show and we'll start off with finishing, uh, with talking about my finish spin that I'm quite excited about. So Eve and I have both had, and many of you know who Eve is from being in the community for a long time. She's Ollie Cobb on um, the Slack channel. Her and I have had these like languishing spins. And one of them she has that's languishing is a Beaumont, 
uh, I think it's Hakunya. It's a alpaca. that her and I are both actually working on. And I'll hold this up, hopefully it won't blow out the camera, but it's a Beaumont um, Hakuya Roving for $49.51. Um, the Beaumont was too fine to go through the pin drafter, so they added in the 50% camelid. And uh, it's just gorgeously prepped. And so Eve shared some of it with me. And she has been working through hers and wanting to do a big sweater spin. And I just started mine. Um, it's on the Lendrum Saxony and I, ha I, j I literally like have done like two yards. So I'm not kind of quite ready to, to talk about it just yet because I haven't actually like sampled. I haven't kind of done anything with it yet. And um, so she has had this languishing on her wheel for quite a while and she's been trying to get through a, um, Magicraft bobbins, which are quite big, and spinning for a sweater. And then uh, I have had this Romney bat languishing forever, um, which you guys know about. And this was the bat that was bigger than me and it was just massive and I was really getting bogged down with it and I was spinning it on my Ashford E-Spinner 3 and trying to go for sort of a lower twist, um, realigning the fibers a little bit, kind of a woolen, woolen preparation with a very long staple and trying to kind of navigate um, how to sort of slightly realign the fibers and um, uh, basically like, you know, kind of how was I gonna spin this yarn? So I have a couple of like reflections about it. Um, number one, in some ways I kind of wish I had made this a two ply because I would have gotten quite a bit more yardage. Like I would have sort of had another third of the yardage and um, if I had used the, uh, and, and instead I had gone for the three ply because I wanted the slightly rounder yarn. I really liked my three ply sample, which is this one here. It's just got a lovely halo because with a woolen prep, you're not going to get away from that halo no matter what. And um, I really liked the twist angle and I liked the feel of the yarn. And if you have a look at the drape, like it just has this lovely, um, it just falls beautifully. Um, this has been skeined for quite a while during the whole spin, so it's a little bit kinky and curly, but it's just got this really, really lovely feel. I'll just hold it under the camera here. And, um, you know, I just, I really liked it. It was never going to be like super worsted spun because of course it was from this like really woolen prep. Uh, very, very, um, difficult. I think probably originally the bat was sort of more meant for like, um, uh, something like, um, you know, a batting or, Maybe not bedding because it wasn't a huge bat, but you know, it, it was sort of a, a on, on the little bit. I, I think if it had gone through the pin drafter, it would have been quite difficult to spin. So, being a big bat, it was sort of a little bit more uh, manageable because you could at least rip it apart and then, and then, like I showed you guys, I, I drafted it um, and did all that pre drafting. So, Eve had sort of challenged me that by this coming Friday, it would be done. Sorry, my hair keeps getting in my mouth, so it's just better if I tie it back sometimes. It's right at that like super annoying length where it like kind of comes up onto my mouth and it's it's not long enough yet to just kind of hang. I know, <laughs> girl problems sometimes. Well, I guess men who have long hair too, they must, it must kind of get into their mouth sometimes when it's a certain length as well. I'm thinking out loud. Mm. So I don't know if you guys ever experienced this. I would love to hear it. When you have these bigger projects and you're trying to stay motivated, and you're trying to sort of keep yourself on track, it's really easy, especially because of the podcast and the content and whatnot that I create for you guys every month and all the teaching. I sort of feel like sometimes it's like, you know, you're working on something and you're really hyper-focused and you're getting stuff done. And then it's like, squirrel! <laughs> and you're kind of off onto this other, onto this other track. And um, it's not a bad thing. It's just that um, these spins that are a little bit more laborious, I think they end up kind of languishing for a while. And it's not something that I really like to have happen. I don't like having stuff languish like that because I run out of steam. Um, it becomes a slog. And I start to kind of um, second guess myself. Like, is this um, what I wanted to spin it as? Is this gonna work? Um, the sweater that I had picked out for the yarn, I'm not sure I have enough yardage. You know, it's like all that kind of stuff. So what's ended up happening is I have about 800 yards. So it's not as much as I had hoped. Um, I suspect the grist isn't very high, but I, have, I haven't checked it yet. 
Um, so this big skein here, I basically have three skeins that are about 275 yards. It was some, one's close to 300, one's close to 260, but basically it's three times 275, whatever that works out to be. It's about 800. So, um, the the finished yarn so this skein is completely dry i have washed them that's why i was going to do grist and yardage calculations and whatnot later um but this these skeins like they the the three ply was definitely as much as i would have liked the, the yardage of the two ply the three ply was definitely the way to go because the yarn is is a very light sport um it'll knit up as a heavy fingering light sport and i think actually if i knit it on like um, four millimeter needles it'll actually be quite lovely because it'll give the yarn room to kind of bloom even a little bit more and to hang because if I knit it on like 3.5 millimeter needles or 3.25 millimeter needles um, so more of like a true heavy fingering light sport uh, gauge which is what this yarn is um, it's going to be very coarse and very wiry and it won't kind of lay nicely and sort of allow that natural drape of the longer uh, wool to come through um, it'll become a bit crisp and it'll it'll sort of feel a bit crisp in the knitted fabric so um, this uh, the swatches that I had done were on four millimeter needles and I had swatched for the gentle morning because originally this was going to be for my mom but it's not really yarn that I think that she would enjoy wearing next to her skin and it's not the color that she would want um, she really only wears black and navy blue so I actually bought some commercial black yarn for her gentle morning. I haven't cast it on yet, but it's it's in the queue, if you will. So my original plan was to knit Fennel with this, which is a pattern by Orlane Souche. It's really, really sweet. Um, it's a V-neck cardigan, and it uh, comes down. It's not a it's not a low V-neck. It's like right here ish, and um, it's got a, just a lovely kind of. Um, uh, shape to it um, a little bit a line I really like the the aesthetics of her of her sweaters and of her patterns the size that I would make to give me about four inches of positive ease would be um, the 37 and a quarter inch bust and for that one you need 870 yards of yarn and I found Albini was pretty bang on for yardage so um, I don't know if that means that I would need to maybe take it in a little bit at the back because there's quite a bit of extra fabric across the back of the cardigan or if um, it's maybe just not the right pattern maybe I could get by it's knit on for me I, I'm not sure so I will keep you guys posted I've already done some I, I had done that gauge swatch to get gauge and um, I, I would be short about 70 yards of yarn to make that size so I hate having to make bracelet length sleeves. So yeah, one of these actually isn't um, dry. This one is actually still quite damp. And if you notice like tied into its skein, it, the angle of twist is quite tight. And uh, whereas with these other ones that are completely dry, the angle of twist is a little bit less. Is they're a little bit more like they've come into their own a little bit and the funny thing is the cameras because of the lighting um, the cameras are kind of blowing out the color of this um, a little bit this it's more taupey it's more brown it's not quite so gray the way that it's registering so I'll see if I can find I'll, I'll post some photos later and um, share that with you guys I'm gonna untie this one because actually this one is the one that's wet and I'm just gonna hang it over the side of my desk over here so that it can continue to dry because it's um the other, the other two dried no problem, but I don't know, that third one just would not, um, it wouldn't let go of the moisture, which is fine. Sometimes they just take longer to dry. The Romney was really lovely to work with. I'm actually really glad that I got it spun. Do you know what I mean? Like it was a huge amount of fiber. It had been in my stash for quite a while and um, I was just really glad to get it, to get it spun. Like it was just really lovely. Um, to get something quite substantial out of my stash because I have quite a few quite substantial um, uh, collections of fiber and it's nice to feel like you're kind of getting getting your way through um, have you sampled the long way homestead breed of the month bump compared to the this Romney you just finished oh um, I actually haven't gotten Romney yet from that from the long way homestead I got um, I've had Coriadel Icelandic Finn Rambouillet 
and I can't remember what the one was that I just got. I haven't opened it yet. Uh, what was it? It wasn't Romney though. I haven't gotten Romney yet. Yeah, so I it would be um, I'd be very curious to uh, compare because they're both carded preps. So the Long Way Homestead Breed Study, it's 12 months. Um, it's uh, all pin drafted roving from their um, mill. And um, yeah, I uh, it, it'd be interesting to compare them side by side because the pin drafted roving um, that was the Romney mohair blend that I spun for the Albini sweater uh, was very different from this. Like it was way, it was shorter. Um, it was a little bit more fuzzy, a little bit more haloed. Um, but that was probably a little bit of the Romney or of the mohair mixed in as well. Um, but this was definitely like Romney. This was from definitely like an adult fleece. Um, it was a little bit dry, a little bit coarser, probably from the washing and milling process. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Big projects that you tackle in small bits. Exactly. Diana. Yeah. I am never hyper-focused in getting stuff done. I just work with the squirrels. <laughs> That's awesome, Sarah. <laughs> I love it. Um, Let's see what else you guys, I, I want to keep up with chat. Sometimes it's hard to um, keep up with chat because you guys are so fast and I have it set to ultra low. So then I see the, the messages um, a little bit slower. Um, oh yes. So need, uh, so, uh, need to do a challenge with someone to get my massive amount of Shetland spun that I, uh, Shetland blend, uh, that she made to get it all spun up. So Deej, um, if you, um, uh, challenge somebody in the community, um, they'll definitely pick you up on the other side, um, and do that with you because yes, uh, many of us, it's, it's a really nice thing to have somebody to just check in with, even if there's no like actual time frame. it's just nice to have somebody to check in with. I have some Jacob bats I've been sadly neglecting for a few years. Oh, Becca, you need to jump in with us and, and get this stuff spun up. Um, oh, Border Cheviot. Oh, that sounds lovely. Um, so, uh, Jose, the breed and color study yarns for now. She's just wondering how she can get them. So the colorways are available in Katrina's, um, website on different bases um because of the always believe the popularity of that colorway um the the she's dyed the always believe colorway up on other bases but the shetland itself is gone um that was back in january it was um sort of that week that people had access to that stuff there was a pre-order and whatnot and it was all back then and the discount was ordered was offered at that time then um so our next uh breeding color study will be starting in july so if um if you want to participate in breeding color study definitely um, pay attention so that we are, um, when we start up again in July, you'll be ready to go. Um, but the colorway, if you only are worried about the colorway or want to spin the colorway, um, you can go to craftyjacks.ca and click on fiber in her store. And, um, there's colorways in there dyed on fiber. Um, just go to the braids, I think. And then you can click on the braids and you can order that always believe colorway. I'm pretty sure she, that's how she's done it. So like you can go into BFL silk and you can click on always believe. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, some options there for you, but you can't get the Shetland anymore. Um, so hive mind. So, um, I had finished this Merino Alp, uh, Kiviet blend, which is going to be the topic of the content for April. So we won't go into too, too much detail about it just because I'm going to be repeating myself in April. Um, but basically this yarn is a two ply. It's a very, very light fingering. Um, it's almost kind of lace. It's very, very, very light. I can't believe how light it is. Like it's just like holding air and, um, I got uh, 380 yards of yarn um, from about 65 grams of fiber, which is just unbelievable. So the grist was like 2,600 or something like that. It was just unbelievable. And um, I kind of got it into my head. Um, Deb Robeson and Carol Lacarius, they had written in a Fleece and Fiber source book that um, Kiviet tends to obstruct stitch patterning because it's quite fuzzy and, and haloed. Um, and it's got this, like, I don't know if you can see if I just flip the camera for just a sec, I don't know if you can see, but if you look on, on the corners of the yarn, 
Let me see if I can do it against the, it has to go in front of my face so that it doesn't, so that the camera doesn't focus on my face. Um, if you notice here, like where my finger is and I'll move my finger in a sec, but just have a look at that. Like it almost kind of looks like there's like, it's halo, but it's, it's just so, so, so fuzzy. And it's so, um, it's almost like ba baby hair fine. And that texture on the surface of the Kiviet, um, really obstructs, I'm still pulling out guard hairs. Um, it's become like an obsession. <laughs> And I'm not even OCD. Um, the these baby high, baby fine hairs, um, they Robson and, and Icarius talk a lot about um, in in the fleece and fiber source book about about how that really obstructs stitch patterning. So like, you know, Kiviet is not the yarn to make. And if you guys have ever seen like an Angora rabbit scarf, or you've seen. Um, a 100% Kiviet garment. Um, any of these fibers that sort of have that that hairy quality like that, that's so ultra, ultra fine. Um, if you see them knit up in lace or you see them knit up in cables um, or you see any kind of stitch patterning, it's basically lost. So you just sort of lose that like overall texture. And I was really curious just to see this in real life because I didn't have enough yarn. Actually, I probably would have, but um, I, I would, I, at that point, I didn't think that I had enough yarn to knit an entire pair of mitts with just the one skein, but actually I, I did after all, um, because of the yardage, but I started looking through all my patterns and I have a, a lot of my patterns on Ravelry so that I can search in my library. Uh, it's a very handy feature for those who use Ravelry. Anyways, one of the patterns that came up was in Yarnitecture, which of course is one of my favorite books and it's by my friend Jillian Moreno. And, um, it's just a fantastic resource. And, um, You'll remember that Greta Lynn in our community had knit uh, this sweater, the goddess pullover that we were all obsessing about. And so I chose these mitts here, um, the hive mind mitts. And actually they've since been re-released by Adrian um, Basilia um, as a uh, pattern on its own because the book's been out long enough now. Um, and so I decided to cast them on. So I'll move this out of the way so you don't have that really colorful background. Um, and this is the first mitt. And you know, it's funny because the, the Kiviet does totally obstruct the color work. Like in here where the West Coast BFL, which I spun in my very first tour, um, uh, Spinzilla, when Spinzilla was still a thing back in 2014, I knit, I, or no, was it 2000? Yeah, it was 2014, the very first year. Um, when you get to these areas of this yarn where it's like um, uh, lighter and kind of that taupey green color, you can see it's coming through here. And then it came through here where there was a bunch of barber pulling. You do totally lose the uh, two color contrast. Um, and you can see here's the palm, same thing. Um, but on the other hand, it's really still quite pleasing. It's not as high contrast as I like to see. I could have chosen something much brighter that would stand out more against the Kiviet, but I love red and brown together, like that silvery gray brown. I just love it with, with deep red tones. And I'm not really a red person. So um, anytime I get a chance to work with red, I do, because it, I love these colors. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed knitting this. So I worked on it over the, the course of the week on 3.25 millimeter needles. I just have to do the thumb. But I think what I might do is the second mitt first, and then I'll go back and do both thumbs at the same time, and I'll just bang them out and do them in one session. Uh, because I really like doing the thumbs at the same time so that I do them exactly the same way. So, yeah. Oh, that's a great question, Zan. Does anybody have a favorite toque or mitten color work pattern that they recommend? She wants to use her Char Breed Breeding Color Study yarn for one, but she's overwhelmed by the options. I totally agree. This is actually a really easy pattern because you start off with just ribbing. There's no Latvian braid or I-cord cast on or like there's nothing complicated. So if you're looking for something just really, really straightforward, um, these are definitely an option. I think in the yarn and texture pattern, I might be wrong. So I'm, I'm just like saying this with the caveat that I might be wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's a stitch count problem and there's a problem with the chart because it, I'll, I'll just um, come over here for a second. I'll show you what I mean. 
um, just move the camera a bit so that I, I don't go off screen. Um, if you look at the side here, it doesn't include the stitch count in the cast on that you need for the uh, two colors to run up the side here. So I ended up with not enough stitches where I only had the one color run up. And of course you use those two colors at the top of the mitt to do a cast off that looks like this. So this is what it's, these haven't been blocked yet. So just bear with me here because they're, they're a bit tight. Like the color work needs to be actually blocked out and, and set. Um, but you see how you've got the two colors running up there with the with the kiviet in between the, this the brown yarn and then it, that's how you do your decreases is in each of those sections there there's a miss there's there's this limit the number of stitches that you're told to cast on doesn't allow you to set that up on both sides so just be aware um, that you may need to add a stitch um, in after your ribbing to make sure that your um, stitch counts work out properly. So that was something that came up after. So <laughs> also I found, oh, I love corrugated rib. Oh, you're hilarious, Kelly. I feel personally attacked with Latvian braids and I-cord cast on. <laughs> I'm a big fan of corrugated rib. You know, it's so funny, actually. I, um, when I'm looking at, at like toucan and uh, mitten patterns, um, I don't even think about those things. Like if I like the pattern, I just go ahead and, and pick them. Although you guys know in all the years of podcasting, I don't make mittens. Like this is probably only my second pair ever. Um, and I was sort of looking at my, my socks and I was looking at my sweaters and stuff and I was like, why am I, why do I have no mittens? Cause I love them. I think they're wonderful. So, um, that was one of the things that I wanted to, um, start working on was doing more, more mittens. Although I think these are going to be a little bit too big cause my thumb is, um, the thumb is down here. This is what always happens. They end up being too long for me because my hands aren't particularly long. I probably needed to take out one of the chart repeats. It's not too late though. I could rip back. Um, but it's funny because I know for some people when they're first learning this stuff, it's a little bit intimidating um, trying to figure out how to how to do some of those things. There are some really good YouTube um, uh, links for people who want to learn how to do some of that stuff. So the Latvian braids and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Um, so let's go into community participation only because uh, we've got queries and explorations after the podcast today. And um, I want to make sure that I that we finish the live stream in good time so that we can get set up for that because these weeks where there's both, um, I just have to be aware. I just have to keep it in the back of my mind. Um, and uh, oh, my Romney, I was going to just really quickly chat about my Romney. I won't, I won't talk about it a lot. I actually did get all of the fiber prepped for it. So that was something that I really wanted to get done. So I've got two more bobbins to spin. This is the maize colorway. It's just plain Louette Romney. And um, I've got it all prepped in a basket. I, and I just need to wind it onto a distaff. And I, I may or may not wind all of it on. I might just wind some of it onto my, my, one of my distaffs. Um, because, uh, I, I sort of don't, it doesn't matter to me if I have all of it prepped and ready to go, but it'd be nice to have some of it on the distaff and ready to go. Cause I spun the rest of it on it off a of distaff. It's just fiber management. Like it's four ounces of fiber. I've got it all ready to go. I may as well take the time to wind it onto a distaff and just make the spinning really super easy. Cause it just manages your fiber. It just keeps it prepped, keeps it organized. And then um, you can just sit down and spin. So the other thing actually that I have almost finished is uh, my breeding color study Murit braid. So the, the Murit one I've almost got finished. I have half, I have one more bobbin. So a half of a bobbin left to go. Sorry, half of the spin, one bobbin left to go. And then I've got the other two uh, colorways left. So that's actually been really nice to sit quietly and just work on that. Um, I'm kind of spinning them um, just default. Like I'm just kind of spinning, um, which is kind of, it's actually a really nice place to be, a nice way of doing doing life. So I like the Saltwater Mitt series of books for colorwork mitts. Oh, that's a great suggestion, Kelly. I think Diana has that book and because I've looked at it. I'm pretty sure it was at Diana's house. There are some beautiful patterns in there. Um, I am obsessed with convertibles, fingerless mitts. The flip top is so fun. Agreed, Zan, they're so much fun, especially for people who are using the subway and whatnot or the train and are having to get cards out to swipe as they go through and need their fingers to be able to do stuff. Um, instead of ripping back, yeah, totally. That's actually not a bad idea, Dorothy. 
Um, I like the fuzzy look for certain color work patterns. Reminds me of the mohair blend yarns used in the Boha sweaters, like the Impressionist paintings with all the blending. It's true, Becca. That's a really great um, uh, comment. And actually, when I posted these on the Slack channel to say, you know, this is a really good example of low contrast color work. A lot of people chimed in, just like uh, Diane is saying, um, that they actually really like low contrast uh, color work and that this is actually their um, uh, preference, which I thought was really interesting because so often you hear the opposite, that, oh, I was really disappointed by my sweater yoke because there's no contrast. Um, and in the Slack after I, after I um, posted it, uh, people were like, actually, that's my preference. Like, I love that. So... Why is it so fuzzy? The color work is just so very uh, nicely visible. Yeah, the color works. Yeah. Um, why is it so fuzzy? It's because it's so fine. Um, the Kiviet is um, one of the finest fibers on the planet. And um, it's just very, very fine. And it tends to, uh, you know, just the, all those tips and all those little bits, they just pop out and they, it's really hard to capture them um, in the twist and in the yarn. Um, let's see what else you guys are saying. I love the embers hat by Tin Can Knits. Great way to use hand spun. That's a great one, Diana. Good, good. Uh, I had, hadn't even thought of that. I'm using my electric eel wheel workhorse to ply some brown Corydale to use this contrast for my Charolais. That sounds perfect, uh, Zan. I think, um, was it Tracy who had a really bad rollerblading accident yesterday? So Tracy, we're thinking about you if you're watching this later. Um, I think that um, she used some brown contrast with her Charolais and it came out beautifully. Um, she was working on mittens. Um, I love the mitts with the little pocket for the ticket. Oh, I've never seen those, Charlotte. What a cool idea. Uh, Isabel Kramer is working on low contrast color work yokes right now. Good to know, Diane. Hi, Maggie. Good to see you. Isolde Teague has some great color work accessory patterns for all scale levels. Thanks, Janelle. That's great. Especially from past color work clubs because they're made to teach color work. Oh, that's really good to know. That's great. Yeah, because you do have to kind of learn how to do color work. Like with these, because the stitches travel, at most you're, you're traveling three stitches. So you're not, you don't have to, we, you don't have to carry your yarn or catch your floats. Um, but that was something that eluded me for a really long time was how to catch your floats. And um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You just have to find one that you, um, that works for you. But um with with something like this where you where you're only traveling two or three stitches at a time it's nice to just kind of get into the rhythm of doing color work and then you can learn some of those other things later all right let's go to community participation so for march tell us about spring or fall in your area of the world the episode the um, episode thread on ravelry if you're a ravelry user is here i've put it in the live chat it's also in the show notes available at patreon.com slash welford pearls or you can leave a comment right here on YouTube, but don't leave it in the live chat. Leave it on, on the actual comment section. Um, and just tell us about spring if you're in the Northern Hemisphere or what fall is like in your area of the world in the Southern Hemisphere. And like I said last week, I will choose a winner next week because next week's show will be April. Can you guys believe it? Um, I've got half a braid of Panda Lava, Craft, Crafty Jack's uh, panda base um, in Lava Love, or you can have the 100% Targi in Lava Love, um, in the Lava Love colorway. So it'll be really fun to send that out to two different people. So one in April and one in May. And then once you guys have them spun, um, to actually be able to compare them. So two people from the wool and spinning community um, and compare them side by side and see what, see what they look like. Um, that'll be really fun. So we've already talked a little bit about breed and color study today just by me sharing with you um, a, a, some of the answers to a couple of the questions in the chat about breed and color study. But basically breed and color study is a chance for us to come together as a community and to look at a certain fiber um, for six months. And um, we do combed for the first six months of the year and then we do carded for the second six months of the year. And sometimes people manipulate the preps to turn them into carded or turn them into combed. 
um, and that's totally fine, but it comes as sort of comb top for, for the January to June study. And then the July to December study is, is carded. Um, so for this one, we're looking at Shetland on the Always Believe colorway, which has been a big hit with people. And this one was from Cheryl. So she's actually finished this project now. So it's the Mulben, which I've linked in the show note in the show notes, but I'll link it here in the live chat for you guys to have a look at as well. It's a Ravelry link um, for those who are on Ravelry and using Ravelry. Um, she did a sample color work swatch, one mini skein of, of bracelet plied black, two skein of two ply gradient in Always Believe, um, and then one skein of two ply gray, natural gray main color. Um, she will use these yarns for Isolde's Color Work Club 2021 series for a stranded color work cowl called Mulbin. Uh, she wanted this yarn to match the pattern yarn, and I, I'm not even going to try to butcher the name of the yarn, which is a traditional two-ply somewhere between heavy fingering and the light sport. Um, it's about 175 meters per 50 grams. Uh, so Cheryl's pretty sure that she managed to get to the tar close to the target. Um, she spun two bobbins of singles from the white and the Murat half braids of the Always Believe colorway. Uh, and then she had arranged the colors from darkest to lightest or like natural, hand carded them into Rolex and spun long draw. So what did she learn? As Katrina of Crafty Jack says, always, uh, says, always believe. Just like her hike, I didn't think I would make it. The spin was a lot of new challenges all at once. New breed, new long draw, new color management, new yarn weight. But I learned so much from just doing it. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for, for sharing. Um, your yarn turned out absolutely beautiful. I love this color, this photo. Um, and of course, as you can see there, she's got her uh, sample. And see how across the stitches there, um, she only had about three stitches at a time where she was carrying yarn behind. So those are really great color work patterns to learn how to do color work because you're not, like I said, catching floats. I love all of her uh, Rolex. So, and the happy smiley face. So that is breeding color studies that um, Cheryl had posted this week. Oh, Cheryl, she's blushing. <laughs> um, this is from Allison. Uh, this is her 51 yarns. So 51 yarns is going over two years. They're going to be finished actually at the end of this year, which is just crazy. And um, group, this is group B. So we did group A. We finished up in December of 2020. And now group B is going through until uh, December of 2021. They, fit, they started halfway through group A. Um, I don't know if we're going to start another group in January again. I, I'm not, I'm not sure if it, it feels right to run it again. Uh, you guys will have to let me know and reach out and let me know if you want to run through that content again. Um, I'm happy to do it. I just want to make sure that there's enough interest. So this is from Allison. Um, she did, uh, these are her true woolen, her true worsted and her, um, semis so there's um this she started off with clen forest i was waiting for the photos to cycle through she created some bracelet plies after spinning supported long draw out of her clen forest and then lister long wool for the true worsted hand combed spun short forward um and if you notice when the when the photo so this is her clen forest and then um the lister long wool if you the next photo is fascinating because if you look at the one swatch it's biasing quite a bit See how that, that gray swatch there, the white one is perfectly straight and the gray one is biased uh, this way. Um, and she reflects in her uh, post about it that um, she realized afterwards that she had put quite a bit of twist, unneeded twist into the Lister long wool um, as she was spinning. And, you know, I think that's something that we often do with the long wools is you're spinning short forward because it kind of you naturally fall into this long short forward kind of rhythm uh, because they're so long. And um, we tend to be adding twists the whole time. So really interesting that, that she, it actually showed up in her knitted swatch. And then finally, she spun some South Down True Worsted with short backwards. Um, so I think that actually, sorry, that was the swatch that was next to it. And then for her semi woolen sample, she spun some South Down and she chain plied it. Um, and for her semi worsted, she did a Dorset Horn spun short backwards with smoothing. And that's the green one that is so beautiful. Well done, Allison. Lots and lots of spinning and really, really beautifully done. So I think that green swatch was one of the ones that really kind of caught me. I was like, oh, that is beautiful yarn. Well done. This is, I think this is her South Down, I think. 
I can, and then this is the Dorset, the Dorset horn, just beautiful. County of origin, England, micron count 26 to 20 to 33. And this is the swatch. Oh, that's beautiful. Noemi shared a true woolen from her 51 yarn study. I hope I'm saying this right. I might be wrong. This is OSINT fiber. Processed from raw fleece and carted into Rolag spun long draw. It might be the softest gradient I've ever made. Hopefully visible enough in the photos. It looks amazing, Noemi. Um, I think about weaving it instead of knitting. Um, may, might bring out the color shift a bit better. So it's a little bit of a gradient. Um, and then she did an In the Grease uh, from Crossed Shetland and Romneys. She wanted to compare... Um, so she divided up the pile into two 100 gram amounts, kept one raw and, and washed the other. After washing, the skein spun in the grease is actually whiter than the washed one, which is really kind of crazy. So. Yeah, really lovely uh, knitted samples, Holly. You're absolutely right. Um, Noemi says she's currently making the underwing mittens, you know, the ones with the, mo oh yeah, yeah, your moth, uh, situation as the first hand spun color work. It took some time to handle the, um, colorway in such a small circumference, uh, especially at the sides. I always find turning the, the side of mittens is all, when you're doing color work is always the most challenging. Um, the green swatch looks exactly as the sweater from the, from yarn and texture. It's so true. That is so, um, what a, what a, um, a great, um, observation. You're absolutely right. It does. It looks like the cover actually, because if you look at the cover of yarn and texture, that swatch looks the same just with yellow added to it. Nicole shares her tweed yarn. So this is her tweed. Um, she cut some ribbon, silk ribbon and cut them into tiny bits. And then she used her blending board to blend them with some merino. This was a really fun yarn to make, although a bit messy. And she chain plied the singles thinking it would trap the bits a bit better, but she's not sure if maybe she should have done a traditional three ply. I think either way, it's going to be difficult to trap those um, little bits. Uh, but maybe it's just the nature of the yarn. I think you're right, Nicole. Uh, anyone else find bits flying off as you spin? I, I do. Like when I have a lot of silk and oil add to, added to my yarns, I actually find that the bits just, they, they just, they do. They, unless you can really get them trapped into the actual like fibers of the wool, um, they do fly off a little bit. You're always going to lose a little bit. But then if you knit with commercial tweed yarns, that's the case a little bit too. So it kind of is, you know, kind of the nature of the beast, I think. Thank you for sharing all of your 51 yarns, you guys, because I know when we get into the second year, it's really hard to keep your motivation and to keep your momentum going. And sometimes you just kind of have to just do it. Um, you can't, I know when I was creating all the content for that month after month, there were months where I was just like, oh, not more yarns. And um, you just sort of, I, I found more often than not, I had to just do it. I couldn't think about it. I couldn't have any feelings about it. I just had to do it. And um, yeah, I, I think that's just kind of part of the nature of, of these studies sometimes. So if you can keep your momentum going and keep your motivation going from the inspiration that you see in the community, it's, um, you won't be unhappy at the end when you've got, when you've been able to make all these different yarns that you didn't think, not that you weren't capable of making, but that, oh, I'll get to them one day. But the problem is one day never comes. So Diana has a good point here. Um, I love Tweety yarn. Sometimes it is difficult to anchor the bits. If I cart up silk noil first with my hand carters, it helps give them some stuff to anchor it into the spun yarn. Great tip. Has anyone ever tried chopping up fiber in a blender or a food processor? Honestly, Wendy, I have not, but if anybody has, I'm curious to know. I don't think I would want to do that with my blender and my food processor since I pretty much use them every day. <laughs> I wouldn't want to risk breaking them. But uh, if anybody has ever done that, my concern would be that it would get wrapped around the um, where the blades spin. I think that would be actually quite uh, quite a quite a real possibility. So I'd be really worried. Oh, Kelly says the same thing. Yeah, I think I'd be quite worried about that. Iris shares her Zero to Hero, which is a spin along, knit along, make along that goes all year. It's basically go from the fiber um, all the way through to a finished item. And it's sort of an opportunity to experience the whole process supported by others and other inspiration in the community. 
This is Iris's Shifty. Um, she has 450 grams of the main color, 350 grams of contrast color. The grist is about 300 to 380 meters per 100 grams. And this is for her Shifty sweater. Beautiful spinning there, um, Iris, just gorgeous. I love that one little skein that's above the bottom one, the little round, the cake um, with those yellows and blues. I think that's just gorgeous. Debbie has a finished sweater, finished first sweater. She bought a Jacob fleece last August, processed it, spun it, and here we are. Can't wait to wash it and block it. This is beautiful. This is the flax. I'm pretty sure this is flax by Tin Can Knits, and Debbie, you did a beautiful job. I can't wait to see it on you. This is Katie's finished sweater, her Weekender by Andrew Mowry. I only knit for four inches of positive ease, not the 10 that is recommended. I think it looks great, Katie. I wouldn't, on you, I wouldn't have wanted a bigger sweater. Oh wait, we've got two things going here. Hang on, let me take one of these things out. One of these is not like the other. Oh, the one that I chose. Hang on, you guys. Give me a sec. I want to have things mixed up. Um, yeah, it's funny because actually, Katie, I wouldn't have wanted, um, I, I'm not sure that I would have wanted any more positive ease on you, like, because um, I don't think you're very tall. Um, and I just think this is perfect on you. It is a worsted spun two ply from a Rambouillet fleece. She finished the yarn during Tudor fleece in 2020. There was a lot of VM and needed to be flicked before running it through the drum carter. And she also rinsed and washed the sweater three times. That was after washing the fleece and finished yarn multiple times as well. Lesson learned, just because a fleece is cheap does not mean it is worth all the time. Oh my goodness, Katie, preach. <laughs> I still very much enjoy the sweater though and it's about, it used about a thousand yards of yarn. It is beautiful, it looks great on you. Now, this is from Tamar. I think this is our last share for today. Yes, this is her, you saw a little bit of a spoiler a second ago. Um, this is her Zero to Hero Night Shift shawl. So for the better part of 2020, this was in the background spin that she worked on. For a while, she was wanting to knit this shawl to wear with a long white sleeve tee or plain solid tops. It is composed of BFL silk, which she spun fractal two-ply. She tried to choose complementary braid colors, so some jewel tones with muted variations of those colors to hopefully balance the shawl. I think you did a great job, Tamar. Um, a few things went wrong. BFL did not did not want to be spun into a worsted weight yarn easily, so it was a struggle to keep the singles consistent. I suspect, just based on Tamar and her spinning and knowing her um, a little bit, that um, I suspect it wanted to be spun finer. The braids were better suited for a lighter weight yarn. Through pers perseverance, this spin did end up consistent with all final skeins within at least a little less than 10 yards of each other, which is amazing. But she notes, listen to your fiber. And then number two, she couldn't find some of the colors she wanted, so she had to settle for other similar sections, which ended up muddying parts of the shawl. Number three, the yarn should have been a three-ply for less severe color con for less severe color transitions throughout the shawl and for spinning ease. I was so concerned with drape, which is certainly which it certainly is light and drapey, that she didn't consider how this would affect the final spin. Do I hate it? No, I don't. I will wear the hell out of this thing. <laughs> it still is beautiful to me. It is unique and a reminder of my best work at the moment. I've learned a lot about color and color management. I have been contemplating spinning this for this again, taking all that I've learned and following up. Maybe someday. Tamar, I think this is beautiful. I think you did an amazing job. I get what you're saying about the um, worrying about balancing drape versus um, spinning a three ply so that you don't have to spin quite as thickly. I think you still knocked this one out of the park. I think this is just an amazing, amazing shawl and just beautifully done, but I get what you're saying. I think the one thing to take into consideration, I think you actually made the right decision with the two ply, um, because the three ply and going, and because of the way that the mosaic knitting works, you're con it's basically double thick, which is what I'm finding with my shifty sweater and what I found with my shifty cowl. Um, and so I'm, I wonder if you would have found it a little bit uh, bulky, even though it was worsted weight, I wonder if you would have found it a little bit thicker but I think you knocked this out of the park. Just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, San says beautiful weekender. Yeah, Katie did a beautiful job. Love that. Oh, Jacob promo. 
fits so well it looks amazing and then you guys are saying about this being beautiful too you guys have you, you guys are so inspiring like everything that you guys do and make and everything I'm always just bowled over by what you guys do and and how much you create and how much you make it's just amazing um, thank you so much for sharing all that you do and for posting photos and um, just doing all the things that you do and being so supportive and kind to each other in the Slack community and on the Ravelry uh, group. It really means a lot to me and it means a lot to those who um, sort of keep an eye on how the community is running and things that are happening within the community. There's a couple of people that kind of keep their ear to the ground for me and uh, I really appreciate them. Yesterday was uh, our anti-racism book club. Um, I haven't mentioned that on the podcast for a while. Um, it's We're currently doing Empire of Cotton. It's quite a heavy read and actually I, I had to miss yesterday. I was so um, bummed about it because I had organized the week so that I could be able to go and then things kind of fell apart at about 12 o'clock. Um, I was wondering if you guys had decided on how many chapters we were up to. Chapter 10. So what are we reading? What's our... Um, um, assignment and then we can let everybody know because there's a couple of people that are playing catch-up um, so I, myself included I'm finding it very difficult to read quickly um, I finished North and South which is in our regular book club but Empire of Cotton I'm finding I'm really having to pay attention and really like spend time with it I've even had to reread a couple of pages and I'm a, I'm a really good reader like I'm not a fast reader but I'm a good reader um, and uh, okay, so we're going to read chapter 11 to 14. So finishing the book for the 9th of April. We're going to finish the whole book by by April? Holy smokes, I'm not even like a third of the way through. Um, so I will be playing catch up. I won't be able to read it by April 9th. There's no way. Um, but that's totally fine because I know that we want to go on to other books and stuff. So um, I'm happy to keep reading. Uh, I just haven't been able to read as much as I had hoped. You know how it goes, right? Like you get a few pages banged out and you have to put it down. It's a big book. Um, so we'll be finishing up in mid-April and we'll be picking another book. I think we want, we're hoping to kind of continue to focus on the um, underlying textiles theme. Um, I think that's been really meaningful for a lot of people. So, um, oh, that makes me feel better, Becca. A huge chunk of pages at the end are appendices and notes. <laughs> Maybe I should look forward. Maybe I'll feel better if, if I know that like half the book is appendices. Anyhow, uh, it's an excellent book. Even if you're not part of our book club and not part of um, what we're doing, I would highly recommend that you go and get Empire of Cotton out of the out of the library. Um, everybody is enjoying North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. That's been a huge hit. Um, but Empire of Cotton has been a very thought provoking book. And many of us have um, um, really had to wrestle with some of the concepts and some of the things that he talks about. So I would highly, highly recommend uh, finding that book. Unfortunately, it's not available on Audible because um, I do listen to a lot of my books. But in this case, this is a book that you want to actually sit and like read and digest. So until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. I hope you have a wonderful week. And um, we're, we're kind of back to, the kids are back to school on Monday. So actually a little bit of housekeeping just really quickly because our housekeeping posts with all the links and all the alongs and all the community participation, everything, that comes out in the middle of the month. Every month is a separate Patreon post. Um, rather than trying to put it in as the show notes every week, it's just a bit too much. So that will go out mid-April and it's already gone out for eight, for March if you're curious about things. Um, but this week, um, we have, uh, let me just... Um, queue up the calendar. Um, we've got uh, our regular spinning group on Tuesday, which is for um, um, our, our virtual spin group. But then we've got our maker morning that people signed up for April 1st. That is coming up this Thursday. We've got a wool circle live stream on Friday. And then we've got book club on Friday as well at um, um, 8 p.m. What's the time zone, Becca? And then we've got um, uh, the live stream and queries and explorations on Saturday. So we've got uh, queries and explorations today and then we've got it again next week. So lots and lots and lots happening in the community this week. I always find it kind of ramps up after spring break because we've kind of had these two weeks of quiet. So um, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I hope that I see some of you this week and uh, can interact. Um, for those who are Patreon uh members you can absolutely watch the maker mornings they are available uh for the patreon community and actually i just linked the um 
playlist this morning in the chat uh, Slack channel because Marjorie was asking for it. So um, I haven't been able to find it on Audible, Holly. So I wonder if it's not, I have not found it. So if you could, don't mind sending me that link or tagging me in the Slack channel, I cannot find it for the life of me. Um, yeah, that would be uh, very helpful because I have, I, I've looked and looked and looked. I don't know if it's because I'm on .ca. That might be why. Um, maybe it's because I'm on .ca. I don't know. Let's follow up. Okay, have a great week, you guys. Um, for queries and explorations, people, I will see you. Um, I will start the Zoom meeting at 9.45 and then we'll plan to get started at um, 10 o'clock. So I will see you guys in about 15, 15 minutes. Until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, and uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Bye, everyone.